Hey everyone, this is Lynn Bartim, and you are listening to the Apex Hour on KSUU Thunder 91.1. In this show, you get more personal time with the guests who visit Southern Utah University from all over, learning more about their stories and opinions beyond their presentations on stage. We will also give you some new music to listen to and hope to turn you on to some new sounds and new genres. You can find us here every Thursday at 3 p.m. or on the web at seu.edu slash apex. But for now, welcome to this week's show here on Thunder 91.1. Okay, well, welcome, everybody. Welcome in. It is such a pleasure to be back this week uh, for the Apex Hour. This is Lynn Vartan. You're listening to KSU Youth under 91.1. Today, I am joined by an incredible, gosh, I mean, we were saying Renaissance woman, but I mean, the, the list of things that she has done in her life and explored in her life is truly amazing. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation. But I want to tell you a little bit about why she's here on campus uh, and what this event is. This is our second annual Artist in Residence collaboration. Um, we're collaborating with our Southern Utah Museum of Art, Apex Events, of course, um, and the Grace A. Tanner Center uh, for Human Values. So it's been a real pleasure pleasure to have her. She's here for almost a week meeting with students and showing her work. We're going to be showing her film, which we'll talk about. But for the moment, I'd love to welcome to the studio, Zareen Eskandar. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Yay. Well, I feel like you're absolutely a kindred spirit. So I'm really looking forward to our conversation. But to tell our listeners a little bit um, about yourself, I'd love to know kind of just a thumbnail sketch of where the child artist Zareen came from to where she is now. So if you could give us a just a bit of a thumbnail sketch. I know it's like this huge <laughs> wandering story that's so amazing, but just give us a few of the basics and then we'll dig in from there. Well, I think I was I was always creative. My siblings as well, you mm. know. So that's um has always been there. I think everyone has that creativity and that was just whether we choose to take it or not. So oh, you, I, you I do feel that. It. You feel that everyone is creative. Oh yeah. Uh-huh. Well, so, I mean, so I I was I went to a talk by Antonio Damasio. Okay. Um, he's a neuroscientist at USC. Oh, okay. And I don't remember the title of his book that he wrote like this is 10, 12 years ago, where he talks about how human cre- creativity is creativity is a necessary life function of the brain. A necessary life function. It's just like we are we are creative. I might be adding the word necessary, but he was like it's a function of the brain. Oh, I love it. So okay. Don't, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. So yeah. So yeah, I think everyone's creative. I was creative. So I just chose to take that path full on. And um, honestly, I really wanted to be a race car driver. No way, really? See, this is why we have, this is why I say this. (laughs) Really? Like NASCAR, like going around the track? Oh, yeah. I grew up watching NASCAR and Formula One. So I love that stuff. But then that was like, just, you know, I wasn't encouraged. Surprising as all the things I was encouraged, I wasn't encouraged with that. And then I was like, okay, I want to be a pilot. And of course, wow, you have the adrenaline gene built in, it sounds like. No, not really. I'm actually a really cautious. I was a really cautious kid. Really? But race cars and pilots and... Yeah, I don't know. Those things, you know, by the same time, never climbed a tree because I didn't want to fall and break something. Oh, okay. So I have that. So, um, but, and so then dad was like, no to that. I was like, well, then I want to be an architect. And uh-huh. that seemed like, okay, that's good. You know, we'll go with that. So dad I went to design cool school. That. But uh, I, yeah, I went to design school though. I didn't study architecture and I studied automotive design. Oh, wow. Which was absolutely amazing. Really? And um, I double majored that with interior design. Oh, wow. Which, um, but I ended up working in architecture. That's so cool. Of all things. Yeah, but so cool. And then after my very first job after college, I quit my job. And I've been on an artist residency ever since. <laughs> yeah, that's what we were, we were sort of figuring out that your your entire life has been an artist residency. I mean, yeah, has. that's amazing. I also worked at, there was an internship for like six months, yacht design. Oh my gosh, that's, that's so cool. One. Yeah. And so you have lived in several places, but one of the places that you have worked, um, been creative, 
and and have been very connected to is Iceland. Mm -hmm. And so can you tell me a little bit about your your time in Iceland? Um well it's a it's it's a desert. It's a big desert. So I went from Southern California's desert, which I absolutely love. It's my home to that another desert. Yeah. And I'm, I'm looking for a next desert actually to spend a few some few years or months. Um Iceland uh I was very stuck with my work when one of my mentors just told me to go to Iceland. Oh, really? And and I did, and I was supposed to be there for a month at the end of 2 weeks. I I was probably in the most depressing place in all of Iceland that one could put a residency cuz now that I know all of Iceland I'm like this is the most depressing place you could put in a residency. Oh wow, yeah. And it was mismanaged, it didn't have, you know, anything, nothing. So at the end of 2 weeks I'm like I'm out of here. Uh-huh. But it took about like 4 or 5 days for for the shuttle to come and pick me up and oh you know gosh. like take me 8 6 hours back to the city so I can catch my flight to Los Angeles. Yeah. Like get me back home. Yeah. But then um, I just, I had such a great time when I got to the city over the two days I was there that I actually, like in two days, I just suddenly like felt like I met everyone that I should have met mm. before, like an amazing arts community, especially at Lista Haskoli, where of course Adam Taylor was. Yes. Um, and so I decided to stay. And at the same time, what was happening was, so in, I don't know what it, what it is, where you're we are here in Utah with the latitude, but it, in Los Angeles, the day varies a minute or two, right? It gets shorter or longer by a minute or two. And when I arrived in Iceland, it was getting shorter six to seven minutes every day. Mm. So the time is just going chunk, chunk, chunk. You're just losing it, right? Ah. And then, so there was a month of October when I was there and uh, September, October. And so I was like, well, you know, I just met these cool people. I'll just maybe stay here another month, see how the, you know, the darkness is coming in. So then turned into November and then I changed my ticket again, turned into December. <sighs> and then I was like, oh, you know, my 90 day visa tourist is up. I better go home. Ah, Iceland sunk its teeth into you. It's yeah. Here. It's kind of like the same thing's happening to me in New Mexico right now. Yeah. Which I, I totally want to talk about as well. But one of the, I want to get into your work a little bit and, and something that you just talked about led to a question I want to ask. But first, so that our listeners know a little bit about your work, um, you have a large body of work in photography. Um, that's certainly not all of it. But can you can you describe your body of work, which which I know is kind of hard to do because you have work in so many areas. But um, can you share a bit about how how you view your body of work? You have photography, you have a lot of uh, um writing online, uh, you have your work with video games, you have your and then we'll get into the AI. But can you talk a little bit about the scope of your work um, as it exists um, in as tangible artwork forms? Um, well, there is a common, common thread. And as I said, in my talk, it started from a social and environmental critique of architecture. So coming from an architectural background, um, and that's kind of that division that was create that's created by architecture was my first critique of it and why are we you know placed in these it it separates the person from the self it separates person you know the family it breaks a family apart it breaks separates society apart you know so it's that's kind of how i was looking at it and the reason i left my job in architecture was i was that was again the environmental critique of it and the lack of creativity in architecture at the time when I wanted to design a new, um, detail to be constructed for, um, I believe it was like, I can't remember. But anyway, part of the building that was being built. And I was told by my project manager that, Oh, we've always done it this way. So just do it this way. You know, just here, just copy it from when and grabbed another construction sentence. I just copy it from here. I'm like, yeah, but this is not efficient. And, you know, I know you've always done it this way, but this is going to require less of this. And, you know, I just basically gave them like reason why maybe we should try this now. Right. And so I was like, I don't want to work in an environment like this where, you know, it's, and th- this was in the early 2000s. So I was like thinking of where at that time I could, you know, see like environmentally, we need to be start thinking about how we're working in architecture differently. 
And so I, I left that and um, joined um, Dimension Seven in San Francisco, mm. which they were they were creating um, videos. They were the very first VJs, video jockeys yeah. of the rave scene in, on the West Coast. And to me, looking at light as an architecture, oh wow, ar architectural material, like that was my fr that was my first break, okay, into this realm I am now and in materiality, which yeah. is a topic I really like. Was was that that? Oh, I can just use screens and projectors and create new architecture instead of using these materials, right? Right. So, um, so that's been common in my work, uh, and and then from there, of course. It's all perception. Oh so that's God. that's kind of what came out of this, the perception that I have of my body as an architecture or my, you know, um, the architectural body right, this, that I talk, talked about. So the common thread in all of these that I'm exploring is how am I shifting the boundary of my body? Yeah within the different media that I'm working in. Right. So video and photography being, I started with video and then got oh, into photography. Yeah. I started with video. Oh, I didn't realize that. And then you've done some music production and things like that. I saw that somewhere written. What, where is that come in? Um, I, are you referring to the, the work, the music I make for my own work? I'm not, because I'm that, um, well, I studied um, with a pioneer of um, digital granular synthesis. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, Curtis Rose. So, um, during when I was doing my PhD studies at UC Santa Barbara, and that was for the anything that I have learned over the years has not been for commercial purposes, right? Or pursuing them just f you know for for that alone. So I studied you know fashion design at City College in San Francisco, yeah. learned tailoring and pattern making, right? Just so I can use that in my own work, right? right. And so with music, I st I studied composition and yes. um um analog and digital synthesis. That's what I was seeing. Yeah. I, I was noticing on your website, it talks about composition and sound design. And I, yeah. I was just curious. Where, I do those yeah. for my, in, for my own work. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. I mean, it's like when I'm working with clients for marketing and branding, I do use it for them as well. Of course, yeah. I, I do make their videos and I do design the sound for them, but you know, yeah, it does have its commercial value, right. of course, but it's primarily for my own work. And there's even a clothing line in the, in the works, right? Yeah. I really need to do that. That was, that's like 12 years old. What's the cl clothing line like? Is it, is it a women's line? Is it a unisexual line? It what? doesn't have, um, it doesn't have a gender actually, now that I think about it, because oh, cool. it came, because the body of work that it came from, I was l working with, it's the body of work, the, um, architectural organ, mm. um, which looks at the post genderless post human bodies. It was really like I was so heavily into Octavia Butler and Ursula K. Le Guin at the time too. It was when I first was ever read female science fiction art, you right. know, writers, which, right. you know, now I make a deliberate effort to look for for um, female writers, women writers in science fiction. But um, and and in this in this kind of post human society that I had envisioned, where these you can be these beings that have are you know have architectural organs, you're actually genderless. So I was looking for someone who's androgynous to photograph, and this is before like the whole androgynous model look and thing, like you know long before that. And I connected with an amazing human being who's just once, once I connected with her, it was just like, that's her preferred pronoun. Um, it's like, I couldn't envision the work without envisioning her. Yeah. Um, Karis is her name. But so that line of clothing came out at the same time. So that's, it's not, it's genderless, but the whole idea, because at the same time I was studying origami, uh -huh. I spent a like, <laughs> good like year and a half just studying origami from, wow. you know, with all the masters, but you can look, teach everything you can do to yourself. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, it's how can I take one seam and create a form with just one seam. So super minimal. Mm -hmm. And I made prototypes and like little models 
and drawings. I just have to make it. Okay. I just have to make it. Well, I wait for, I want to see Did I it. answer your original question? Yeah, Because I can just like go on. I mean, well, that's the thing. I mean, your career has been so varied and so incredible that we could just g- go any direction and it just leads to something cool. But I just wanted to give <laughs> our listeners, you know, an opportunity to sort of get kind of get a snapshot of who you are and what you do. I've definitely kept myself employed more than anyone else in the last 17 years. That's so cool. (laughs) I mean, that's what it takes, you know. But when we come back, I'd love to get into some of more of the conceptual things that we've been talking about. Um, But I have some music to play. And you might be surprised because this is a music, this is a song that you were uh, telling me. And this is the I Try to Talk to You featuring John Grant. Oh, that's a great music video, isn't it? It is a great music video. The camera and the dance choreography together, like the camera choreography. It is really a cool music video, but we're going to listen to this. This is I Try to Talk to You featuring John Grant. You're listening to KSUU Thunder 91. I could have taught you how to love yourself. I waited patiently. I hope that you will be the one to come to me. I tried to talk to you. I thought that you would recognize the need That you have deep inside But you have to get there by yourself 
All right. Well, that cool song was called I Try to Talk to You. Um, and the original artist or artist on record for the song is Hercules and Love Affair. And it's featuring John Grant. And we got to talking, Zarin Eskandar and I got to talking about John Grant, um, who's an artist that you really like. Isn't that right? His voice is beautiful. I it's know. It's gorgeous. Soft, yeah. yeah. And is he, he's an American artist living in Iceland. Is that, is that right? Or that's right. Yeah. Cool. I don't know much more than that though. Okay. Well, that's yeah. enough. Well, check him out. I it's was like, new to me. Like everyone within my community somehow knows him. I haven't crossed paths with him. That's what's really nice about Iceland. Ah. It's like, there's no concept of celebrity there. Yeah. And you eventually meet everyone. Oh, I love that. It's like a really great <laughs> sense of community. We've been at parties where Bjork is just hanging out. <laughs> no way. Yeah. You do not go up to her and say hello, though. You just oh, really? Do that. No, you can't do that. Okay. But, but the one, one American girl who got really excited and went up to her and Bjork was just not having it. <gasps> Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, if you're at your own <laughs> private party, then it's like you don't want to be bothered. Yeah, totally. I get it. So. Well, I have so many questions about art, but one of the things we were talking about is when you you have been heavily involved in working on a video game design, and that video game ha has a intent to sort of teach some things or get into some things about patterns. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Well, I mean, I should say that that has been on hold because it it took a like I said a hard turn into becoming my company. Right. Okay. But I really want to go back and develop that game. So, um it is meant for a younger audience though anyone can really play it, but the language that we're using is really to attract a, a younger audience. And it's meant to help them break from a linear pattern of time. Okay. So the labyrinth that it's called the clocksmith's labyrinth. Oh, cool title. And I thought so too. Thank oh, you. I love it. <laughs> uh, my friend came up with it, uh, Magnus in Iceland, but, um, you know, labyrinths are pretty popular yeah. in, in all cultures through centuries right. and in games. They're, Mazes. Yeah. They're, and, and, um, but they're physical things mm -hmm. that you go through. And I wanted to create a temporal labyrinth. And for me, it was to explore visually and aesthetically time travel beyond oh. what we see and generally see. But then I thought if I'm, if, if I'm able to create, successfully create this temporal labyrinth and a good narrative for it, for the, the player to go through, maybe, maybe it can help them start experiencing and seeing time and questioning their environment differently. I mean, when you think about how many of my generation will say, what's the most influential game you had if we're architects? We're going to be like Legos. Yeah. You know, so ga the toys and the games, the video games that we've had as children later on do affect us in positive ways of the careers that we choose or True. the interests that we have later in life or the puzzles we solve later in life. Absolutely. And so I wanted to create something. I was like, you know, physics, the artist, photographer who came and just talked to me right after. He's like, times, so he brought up times a huge issue in physics. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, I know. I've talked to Sean Carroll about right, it. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, what if some of these topics in, in physics and in astrophysics, these things that, are, or even their philosophical maybe p problems that we still have that are time related can be solved in, you know, 30, 40 years by a child that was playing this game that I've developed that's allowed them to break linear time. Yeah. So that's, that's really, that sounds amazing. I, I hope, I hope that project, I, I hope it comes back into your life, you know? I hope so too, because what's also happened in the last four years since I put the game on hold, um, Unreal has come out with such much more amazing technology yeah. for environments because it was building the environments that stopped, stopped me. I was it. like, I don't want it to be CG. Using video is going to be just ridiculous. And, you know, the generative stuff looks generative. So what, what do I do? And that's how I got into AI. But now Unreal just has absolutely amazing technology out there and mm. i'm not they're not paying me for anything i'm not putting you know but yeah but i'm just saying well one of the things that we got to talking about when we were when we were discussing this was um how 
how humans um, deal with pattern recognition and are we good at pattern recognition? Are we bad at pattern recognition? And I wonder if you could comment on what you have found about pattern recognition in humans. Cause you were saying that that's something that you're particularly aware of in your own life. And yeah. so I was just curious about if you could comment on that first. And then I have a follow up question. Um, I am particularly good about that. And my mother is too. I think um, we're we're particularly good at being bad about it in general mm. because we're we don't pay attention, right? We're not um, perceptive to the degree that we can be, right? For whatever reason, um, and we think oh, I'm crazy, maybe too much. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know. Honestly, I haven't, I've never studied it or looked into it, into its, in, into its whys. Well, but, but then my question is like, how do we develop, if that's something we are categorically bad at and, and paying attention. So the, the way to develop better pattern recognition is to just pay attention. I think it's paying attention, but it's also, um, being broad in our, being broad in our interests mm. as well. Because if you know a little bit of this and a little bit of that, not like being masters in things, but if you just understand this is how this functions, this is how that functions. Of course, human behavior always goes into that and understanding those things, you can connect it. Can it be, that's a good question. If it, if it can even be, be taught, I'm, I'm sure it can. It's probably what investigators would go to school for. <laughs> yeah, I just wonder about that, you know, because, and I wonder how people can manage that in our current, you know, we're so um, uh, tied to so many things that just pull attention yeah. rather than allow for awareness. Oh, you, and you're attention. absolutely right. So do you have any insight on that or you know comments on should we all throw away our phones i mean no you know. i totally i'm totally pro technology but definitely turn off the notifications you don't need to know every little like you got on instagram and mm -hmm. have that exactly say draw your attention yeah um and then that absolutely opens up your attention for other things but i i i mean i'm not one to criticize um, this generation, I actually think every generation is amazing, it brings its own things. And I love the younger generations. Um, and I'm not to say, oh, this technology does that. And, you know, I'm not negative towards those things in any ways. But the combination of things that are happening definitely are drawing attention away more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, than before. But being inquisitive, being, being slightly suspicious. Yeah. Being slightly suspicious. It's, it, those things are good. Yeah. Um, paying attention to your environment. Yeah. Yeah. Learning human, human behavior. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. When you were talking about Iceland, um, we, we've been talking quite a bit about time. And I know that, that, and, and you were talking about the game, the temporal time travel in the game. And one of the things about, I've been really curious about your work with time and your perception of time. And I was noticing when you were talking about Iceland that you were saying that in your time, in, in the time that you spent there, that, that incrementally the day would get shorter and shorter and chunk and chunk and chunk and chunk. Um, and it seems that some of your photography work, um, when you, when you got into the concept of real time lapse starts to do that as well. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what is real time lapse? Um, you know, cause that's sort of def a defining part of at least a certain time in your work. What is it? What does yeah. that mean? Um, that work happened before Iceland. That was oh. work that I started right after my MFA. Okay. Um, and before I had gone on to an, my next graduate program. And so I was in this space in, in between. Oh, actually, I totally forgot. I did go immediately into an architecture PhD program. I was invited to go in, but I was like, this is not for me. So I just kind of checked out of that and started focusing on um, my photography in the landscape. And I don't honestly remember the string uh, of thought or the the thought process of what led me to that kind of fateful question of what does all of time look like? Um, 
it's because my whole concept, maybe it was around the, the still coming from me looking at the limits of the body and thinking what kind of body would I have to be to experience all of time. I assume that was the thought process. Mm. Um, and it took me a year and a half of trying until I got the right image. I had tried the, I had tried this technique of putting all of time in one image in many different locations around the Mojave that I was hanging out and working at the time. And none of them really came in, but at each time I would develop one image, I would be like, oh, okay, I, I, I can, critiquing your own work is really important. I could critique my own work and be like, okay, this is what I need to change about the next one until I hit on the right image. And it took me a long time to be able to come up with a name for it. And I don't remember how I came up with real time lapse. Part of it is that, um, the time, the time, oh dear. It's like, I didn't study my own, my own work about this. It's like part of it was that time is not lapsing necessarily as a reg regular time lapse would. It's real time. But space within the time is lapsing, even though you get the picture of the whole space in the image. Yeah. But it's, um, it's the space that's lapsing. It's not the time. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's a real time, but it's a space lapse. That's cool. So some people have called it time in parallel, um, time slices. Um, yeah. I mean, that method, that method of work did not exist until. I put that out. Yeah. So it didn't have a name. And I'm like, I have to come up with a name. Well, the results are so beautiful. I mean, those images um, from you. that period are just so striking. And they are, I can see where people say the slices, because they are sort of slices uh, mm -hmm. of time. It, that brings me to another question. Um, and that is the concept of beauty or aesthetic beauty in your work. Is that something that you think about in art? you know, um, oh, this work is beautiful as I see it? Or is it more purely an expression of an idea to um, you? I don't, I mean, I, I'll think, I do think of, what the early, the early work I did, I didn't even think of the um, composition too much in the sense of where am I putting my horizon line? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, I'd put it where I was like, okay, I'll just, that, that frame looks good. I'll do that. But then what the result was going to be was an absolute surprise to me. Mm. And it turned out to be, if I may say, a beautiful image. I mean, that, yeah. and I say that others say that. You yeah. know, people respond so it, strongly it, yes. to that image. And yes. it's done really well. It's like, like that that image has funded a lot of things for me. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's very striking. <laughs> I've been lucky. Yeah, with with it, but I didn't think of I'm going to create a beautiful image. I was creating an image for a concept. Right, and that's my question: is that is that a thread and, that continues through your work? Do, does does creating yes. something beautiful come into play? Um, it's beautiful as a result of if if it's works if the. Uh, works for it's, the concept it works for the concept yeah and so in this sense it worked for the concept but it turned out to be a, a beautiful image but maybe they go hand in hand i don't know maybe because it is a beautiful concept people find it to be a beautiful image as a result yeah but then later on it's led into my regular landscape photography but that was also concept driven and if you look at the image as it is, like that horizon line is smack in the middle. Mm -hmm. Like every, you know, traditional old school art teacher is going to tell you, like the rule of the thirds. I'm like, yeah. mm, no, I'm putting that horizon line right in the middle. Yeah. You know, and even if the landscape has a slope, I'm going to fake it and put that line ah, perfectly great. straight in the middle. Yeah. And, but that's because of the concepts. Like if I'm standing and looking at the landscape, First of all, all my landscapes are not landscapes either. The new ones, they're all vertical. Because uh -huh. if I'm just standing there looking, and maybe you see differently than me, I don't know. It's like that same old question, do we see the same green? I don't right, know. Right, right. So that horizon is going to be in the middle of your view. It's going to be there. Like right. If you t follow it back, it's not going to be here. So there's no rule of thirds. It's going to be in the middle. Right, as we see it. As we see it. Mm -hmm. And as you see it, this is in focus. And your eye is, you're more inclined to go up and down when you're looking, you know? Right. And you're going to see, even if you, you you just look straight ahead, you're going to be seeing this is in focus. The center. This is in focus. The six, like, yeah. 
vertical right. to get the traditional landscape view. And I, this is actually in the essay of my books that were here. Like to get that traditional landscape to, that we all see, we'd have to turn our head like this. I mean, right. yeah, we do that. But if I just sit, stand and stare, it's this. Right. That's true. And I never really thought be, about that. They turned out to be really beautiful landscapes. Everyone, people, not everyone, who are, they, they love them. I'm like, yeah. Thanks. Well, this leads us to a great <laughs> opportunity for another song. But before we do that, I'm sure there's some people that are like, okay, I want to see this work. So w- if people are looking for a way into your work and, and aren't, and don't know you and don't know your work, where should, where should they go? And what should they look at first? Or do you have a preference? Um, you know, my Flickr. Okay. Because that just kind of – recently I've started putting edited pictures on it, but there's older pictures that are just not edited. But it shows kind of where I am, what I'm doing. And kind of, some of my landscapes are there, watermarks, some are not. You know, where I'm living is always there, um, the, my experiences. But my websites. Okay. And yeah. your website is zarine.la, is that right? That's right. So, and that has links to my writing and this web, my works and it's – it's kind of a website I know how to navigate. It's got a bunch of icons. People just have to just click on it. They'll find it. Yeah. And that's X-A-R-E-N-E dot L-A, mm-hmm. I think is the website, if that's right. So check it out, everyone. Okay, it's time for another song. I this is wait. another one. And this song is called Think About Things. And the artist, it's an Icelandic artist. And the name is, um, the first name is D-A-O-I. D-A-O. I? Yeah, and the O has two little dots over it, and then F R E Y R. Oh, it's not um, um, Dadi Freyr? Yeah, I think that's exactly oh, that's what not, it is. Okay, it's not an O. There's a D there. There should be a D. Uh, well, okay. I thought Dadi is Dadi Freyr. Okay. I'm not sure. I'm l- just looking at it on here, but it's I the know, one I, that I, we were I talking you. about that yeah, you yeah, say Dali has Freyr. been all. Yeah, that's it. And the it's song nice. is called Think About Things. So check it out, everyone. We're listening to Icelandic music today. See what you think. You're listening to KSUU Thunder 91.1. Be there, so. Oh. 
Okay. Well, that is like such a cool song. I love it. It's got such a good vibe to it and um, a really trippy modulation to the end. That song is called Think About Things. And and Zarian was absolutely right. I just do not know how to read the Icelandic alphabet very well. So it's, yeah, really? <laughs> so it's D- D A and it's a D. Yeah, it's a D with a little sla- slash through the through it. The it's a the sound. Right, and then and so D A and then that that D with the I and then the last name is F R E Y R and the song is called Think About Things. So if you're interested, check it out. This is Lynn Vartan. You're listening to the Apex Hour, and I'm here back in the studio with Zareen. Welcome back. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to talk about some of the other cool aspects of your life. And I want to start with where you are living because I'm super jealous and I love it. But can you tell everyone a bit about, well, where, not that anybody could find it, right? Where do you live? Um, in, the, in the Zuni Mountains <laughs> in, New, in New Mexico. Um, and you're completely off grid. I'm off grid unless I would, unless I go down uh, to the main road where there's some accommodations there. Um, there's an RV park that has re- really cute cafe, um, cabins at, at, in, in, this is El Moro, New mm. Mexico. So if I go down there, there at the Ancient Way RV park, there, there's cute cabins. So like I was there this past week because I'm like, I need stable internet and power before I go to, Cedar City because I need to finalize my talk here. So yeah, um, but I'm in the Zuni Mountains, and my living conditions are something that I've they've varied between things I've always wanted to try out, and I I went originally to New Mexico for just for two months to work with someone, and then that came to an end, and I just kind of um, went back to Los Angeles. And, and then I just kind of sat there I'm like, I think I'm going to go back to New Mexico. <laughs> yeah. Cause you know, I still want to explore it. Yeah. So yeah, a month later I flew back and I don't really, I was going to drive, you know, they call it the land of enchantment. The joke yes. that this is land of entrapment. Ugh. So the first time I left, I came back a month later. The second time I planned to leave, like literally the, the, the land killed my car. Oh. Like sub sub zero temperatures. Oh my gosh! Sub zero. Wow. Yeah, and the, so my car just like, pff, and I had to. It was down. I was like, well, there it goes. Because after I left here, I was gonna just go drive back to L.A. Yeah, killed my car. I was like, oh no, you're not going anywhere. Yeah, but that's the magic of that land, though. And and as I'm there, I I my story was just echoing, you know, through other people. And I asked them, how'd you get here? Why? You know, it's like, yeah, I just came here and I stayed. So. The first place I stayed was in a straw bale house on 65 acres as the um, person's parents who I was working with, they had the empty house and I just stayed there because there's no accommodation there. It's not like you can go there and rent a place. Right, or, right. So you just kind yeah. of, so that's the first way the land kept me is like, it just keeps offering me these free places, awesome places to live. So I just like, oh yeah, I've always wanted to live in like this kind of situation. Yeah. And then I stayed in these gorgeous um, cop buildings, uh-huh. um, mud, straw, um, absolutely gorgeous architecture, and the Zuni Mountain Sanctuary, which is where the radical fairies are. Mm-hmm. And um, and then in this shack, wood shack made of super cozy inside. Yeah. You know, I should, you know all the accommodations, but made from just found wood. Wow. And a repurposed RV that's now permanent on, yeah. a, on this gorgeous, you know, hand laid rock foundation by an amazing um, artisan there, Navajo artisan who does amazing stonework. And then um, what else? Yeah, just like kind of been rotating through these kinds of living situations. But so living off grid, learning, yeah. learning homesteading skills. Yeah. So like solar, you must be solar power. Solar. And you were saying, I mean, there's, yeah. What is, 
what are the creature comforts? Yeah, so, None. I mean, well, no, every, everything. We uh-huh. have internet and we have power and we have running water. What else do you need? Well, that's true. Good point. Good point. <laughs> we have good outhouses. Point. Yeah. I can take a nice hot shower, like really hot shower. Oh, good. But everything, the thing, everything has to be planned. So our solar panels, there's, of course, the ones that are on the roofs. You can't change those. So they're going to get, you know, depending on the battery system that you have set up, you're going to have so much battery depending on what's drawing on it. So your battery can go out at 8 o'clock or at 11 o'clock at night or maybe 2 in the morning. You don't know. It all varies. You know, these are everything. No one's not like everyone's just done what they can. Right, right. Through knowledge that's in the community. Right. And which is amazing. Um, so the solar panel that, for example, rotates, like once the second day I was there, I learned if I want power to be working on my computer and have internet late into the night, I need to get up and get out there and move that solar panel <laughs> with the sun. So as soon as the sun would pop out and it'd be freezing cold, like I would have to struggle to push the solar panel, rotate it just because it's frozen in place. And so I check it out every day, go check it and rotate it. Ugh. And then you have to figure out, okay, how much water is in the cistern? And that's awesome. You know, it's like, can I take a shower? Or can I do this? How, how much power am I going to draw if I run the washing machine? Do you, does the, is it a very solid, is, is there a solitude aspect? I mean, do you feel lonely? Do you feel, does your time, I mean, how does it feel from a personal standpoint? I love solitude. Mm. Um, I mean, when I'm in Iceland, I pack my truck. Baxter is his name, and I'll go out into the wilderness where it takes a day for anyone to come come to get to me. Yeah. Um, and for you know, we're from you know three weeks to six weeks, whatever. I've stayed out there. It's like I'm the only person to talk to. So you have you know, it's like you have to really like yourself. Yeah. You know, be able to entertain yourself, not get bored, um, and not get depressed, not yeah, get right. not feel lonely and get sad about you know. So, you know, thankfully, I can manage all of that really well. Yeah. I love the solitude. I mean, um, yeah. It's probably very creative also. It's, you know, I, I can't, I don't end up wasting my time. Yeah. What's lovely is like there's chores that need to be done in the morning because when you're out living in these properties, like one of my friends is badass 70 year old Jesse Gray. Like she gets up at, you know, four in the morning, but by nine in the morning, she's done everything and the rest of the day she just chills. But, you know, you got to feed the animals. You got to, you know, just do what you need to do yeah, to, right. to make the property function. All these things that, you know, in a city is taken care of, right. care of That's for right. us. That's right. So, but it's, it's really lovely to, to have this experience to be like, okay, yeah, I got to go, you know, make sure that chickens are taken care of yeah. and feed this and you know the animals put you on a, as you know even yeah. even if in an urban way your animals put you on a schedule right. so now add more to that mm-hmm. and add the you know things that you have to do and then yeah like i was saying you can go to bed at country midnight which is 8 p.m <laughs> or that's when you know i you fill your time with yeah. you know, other things other yeah. things yeah so that's important well, you have another great passion in your life um, that has given you so much community and excitement and, and adventure. And that's the, the rallies that you go on with the Gambler 500 <laughs> group. So I'm sure some of our audience has heard of that and understands it, but some don't. So can you tell us what is that about? What is that world? <laughs> the Gambler 500. Uh, well, 500 miles and a $500 hoopty. I mean, that's not the $500 isn't, you know, but the cheaper your car is, the more fun you have. But it's basically, um, it's the largest trail cleanup in the US. I don't know the numbers, but it's like massive tons of trash that we, we, the community have picked up during our rallies from national from blm land public lands Mm -hmm. national forests Mm -hmm. um and in some of some states they just love us i know what for example one of the coordinators in washington just got a five thousand dollar grant from olympic national forest to to do um to organize his events for the trail cleanups and so it's it's common you know is it just once a year or is it more often depending on oh it's as often as often uh, it's all over the u.s i just started the new mexico Ah, chapter back in this well i started it yeah our first one was december and next one's coming up may march march 28th and yeah it's as i think there's a some how many states wouldn't have it still 
I think New England. Those states yeah, don't have maybe. Vermont. Just yeah. someone organized the first one. Vermont. Oh, that's Some cool. states. But what's been interesting is it's shedding light on issues of access, public access to public land, right, right, right. Private ownership. That's also reduced access to public mm-hmm. lands for various reasons, like easements, or just there is no public land. Like mm-hmm. places like Ohio, Virginia, Pennsylvania. It's like, well, they've all just been mining and this and that. And it's like there is no public land to just go out and have fun. And then. Or they're confined into like off-road parks. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, no, it's not the same. So it sounds like it's like the best of all worlds. It's like great people, great adventure, off-roading. There's parties. It's a great cause. It sounds like it's all these things. It is. It's brought an incredible group of people from all walks of life. I read an article that said it was like Mad Max, but with way nicer people. (laughs) <laughs> oh, I have, I wouldn't say that. Well, I mean, yeah, my, I don't. It's like the other. Yeah, it's a different class of people. Yeah, it's and not. so if people want to get involved in this, or like, yeah, that's like because you found it by saying like, oh, these are my people. I want to know more. If yeah. people are listening and want to find out more, where do how do they find out about Gambler Five Hundred? Gambler Five Hundred dot com. Okay, and the Gambler Five Hundred Rally Group on Facebook, and Utah has Gambler Five Hundred. If they just look up on Facebook. Um, I believe it's um, Cameron Avery, if he's listening. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think he's the coordinator, if I'm not mistaken. And and most of these vehicles have names. Yours has a name. Mine has a name, Drecky Blanco. Where did that name come from? <laughs> from my friend's Facebook comments. Oh, my gosh. Oh. So in Iceland, these cars are called Amerisku Drecky. Okay. American Dragon. Oh. So one friend commented that when I said, hey, I need to name him now. And another friend commented Caballo Blanco, White Horse. Yeah, right. And then I was like, oh, Drecky Blanco. Oh, and White it just Dragon. fit together so good. I love it. Oh my gosh. Okay, so I have my last song to play, and it is called Chevy Impala. Yeah. So, that, <laughs> so that's the link, um, and it's a really interesting artist that I found recently. Her name is Lolo, and then Zui Z O U A I. Um, so yeah, check her out. See what you think. KSUU Thunder ninety one point one. Cause I've got all. The time when the sun sets, I don't mind. Cause when I wake up, I'll be in my Chevy and Paula. Everybody looking at my right Everybody looking at my right All the boys they 
Well, that was Chevy Impala. I really like that song. And that artist is Lolo, Lolo, L-O-L-O, Z-O-U-A-I is uh, her name. And the song is called Chevy Impala. So we are almost out of time here, which is just always blows my mind how quickly the time goes. And I have so enjoyed talking to Zarin. Thank you so much. We want to make sure to plug your website again, which is Zarin, um, X-A-R-E-N-E dot L-A. So be sure to check it out. But I have my final question for you. Are you ready? It's a very serious question. Uh, <laughs> and it's, uh, it's not. It's just a very playful question. It's an opportunity for our, our audience to get to know you a little bit more. And it's, the question is like, what's turning you on this week? And it can be anything. It can be a movie or a TV show or a book or whatever. It could be your favorite brand of lipstick. It could be anything you want. So Zarin Eskandar, what is turning you on this week? Well, you know, the badass 70-year-old I told you about, yeah. Jessie Gray, she brews beer with herbs. <gasps> oh, how and cool. And I am looking forward to her beer with mugwort. Oh, my gosh. Yes. And can you really taste that? Because I've had beer with jasmine in it, and I and you can- Oh, you, you can taste it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. and she has beer with oregano. You can taste it. Oh, my it. gosh. Oh, yeah. She's just, yeah. So I'm looking forward to that because she's also going to teach me her brews because she lives off grid. Yeah. So, and, you know, she has this little- Airstream set up where her she's brewing in and making her chocolate and whatnot. Oh my god! So it's like she's she's streamlined it. Yeah, it's minimal. So I'm looking forward to that. Oh my gosh, that's so cool! Well, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> thank well, you. It's been such a blast to have you, and thank you so much for your time and for being on the show with it me. It was my pleasure. I love your work. I love. I can't wait thank to see you. what you do next. I mean, it's like I'm going to be a long term fan following you all throughout your career. So thanks thank so you. much. All right, we'll see you all next week. Thanks so much for listening to the Apex Hour here on KSUU Thunder ninety one point one. Come find us again next Thursday at 3 p.m. for more conversations with the visiting guests at Southern Utah University and new music to discover for your next playlist. And in the meantime, we would love to see you at our events on campus. To find out more, check out suu.edu slash apex. Until next week, this is Lynn Vartan saying goodbye from the Apex Hour here on Thunder 91.1.